Hey everyone, and welcome to the Airworthy second channel where we can talk about low pressure topics with minimal fuss. So today I wanna to talk about workflow efficiency and optimization in Ableton Live and how to make your sessions in this wonderful door as seamless as possible. So I'm gonna be skipping over the standard shortcuts that are spoken about in most of these videos, like using shift tab to get inside of a MIDI clip or scrubbing MIDI inside of a MIDI clip, um, et cetera, et cetera, and those kind of things. If you don't know those, check out my main channel, Airworthy, um, and I will be doing a video breaking down those kinds of workflow hacks very, very soon. But for now, we are going to be speaking more so about intermediate to advanced workflow hacks and those are mostly going to revolve around key mapping as well as Max for Live devices. So jumping right into it, when I use key mapping, I will mostly use the number keys. So one to nine at the top of my keyboard and then zero to nine on my number pad on the right side of my keyboard. Now, if you don't know what a key map is, it basically allows you to link any key on your keyboard to almost any function inside of Ableton. Um, so this could be things like selecting a track, like if I wanna select my listen bus or select the master, it could be things like turning a track on and off um, and a variety of other things. So starting off, we'll go from one to nine on my keyboard. Starting off with one, number one, I actually leave this open specifically for A-B testing, whether that's A-Bing two tracks, like let's say I'm working on a song and I've got two different kick drums and I can't decide which one I like more. So then what I'll do is I'll link number one, which again is always open to the on and off switch of both of them, disable one of them, and then you can press one and it will alternate. If you leave them both on, it'll just turn them on and off in sync. And this also works very nicely for plugins. Like if I've got two weird EQ curves and I can't decide which one I think is better, exact same process. Okay, but now obviously we'd have to make sure to remove it over here. So whenever I am creating this AB situation with the one hot key, before I even map it, what I do is open up my key mapping, which you can do by clicking up here or with the shortcut Command K. And then I open my browser and I look for anything that's already mapped to one and I delete it all because I know if it's mapped to one and I'm not currently aware of it, that means I've used it already and made my decision so it can go. Now I can go ahead and do the new AB mapping, which in this case was on this EQ, map it, and now we're not affecting a kick and the AB is working fine. So that's number one. It's one of the first key maps that I ever added to my session many, many years ago and was kind of the first thing that led me down a deep rabbit hole of optimizing my workflow inside of Ableton. So number two links to something on my main channel. It links to an auto filter. So this auto filter sits up at 200 Hertz and it is purely for my listening purposes. Um, if I'm in a studio session with a collaborator and I wanna quickly hear what they're saying, um, I will then activate this as I find sub frequencies kind of mask voices the most in a room uh, because they take up so much energy. So yeah, if I need to quickly hear something or maybe even if I'm on my own, but I'm like, tweaking the hi-hats, you know, I don't need to be hearing all the subs, let's give our ears a break. This really, really, really helps prevent ear fatigue. I used to have this down at 80, so it was only taking away out the sub frequencies, but quite recently, I'm ashamed to admit, I was exporting stems for a very large mix down, and the stems took hours, I think two and a half hours, three hours to export, and when I listened back to them, I realized there was no subs. And that was because this was left on and I didn't notice it because it was so low. So I now have it at, up at 200 so that when it's on, it is impossible to miss. Next up is one of my favorite ones and is actually the reason that I'm making this video is MIDI pre-listen. Inside of every single MIDI piano roll clip, there's this little switch which allows you, whenever you select a note, if it is on, you will hear what that note is doing. If it's off, you will simply select the note with no sound. Right now we're not hearing anything because there's no kick sample loaded in, so just take my word for it. But you can actually link this to a macro. So I've linked that to number three on my keyboard because that's kind of where my hand frequently rests. And so then I can just click three, enable and disable it, no worries. Number four on my keyboard links to a Max for Live device, which we will cover in part two of this video. So let's jump on to five. 
So five, six, and seven are all linked to reference tracks. I by default only have one in my session, but if I find myself using up to three references, I have never found myself needing more than three references yet, so I only use up to seven, um, but it is linked to the solo switch on my reference. So when I, I make sure my reference track is turned off, and then when I hit five, it will solo my reference, and then when I hit five again, it will go back to my track. This even works if you are inside of the piano roll. I could be tweaking notes here and then want to change back to my reference. And so that's very handy if you're someone like me who works with the piano roll in full screen. Let's say here, then you wanted to listen to your reference, you could quickly do it. I don't actually use eight and nine. Maybe you guys could help me out with that. So let's jump over to some of the non-numerical key mappings that I have. Alphabetical, I should say. So we can start off with the V key and the grave key. So these are used for selecting tracks. And this is very handy for, let's say I'm deep into a bunch of tracks over here and I don't feel like scrolling all the way down to my listen bus to check my analyzers. I can just hit the grave key, which is right underneath your escape key at the top left of your keyboard, hit that and boom, my listen bus is now selected. I can then choose all the analyzers here, check out and then immediately go back to my kick drum. Then I have my metronome linked to shift M or just capital M. And the reason I've chosen capital is so that it doesn't interfere with lowercase M, which triggers your computer keyboard as a MIDI keyboard. Then I have lowercase L set up for setting and deleting track markers. And the reason I use lowercase is because capital L is used somewhere else. So this is very handy if let's say you're listening to a vocal take and you want to identify areas where maybe they could have improved a little bit. Well, you can just play and say, oh, no, I don't like that. Mm, don't like that. That's not great. Uh, yeah, there and so on and so forth. So it's very, very handy for adding markers on the fly. Then continuing with the theme of markers, I actually have this marker loaded in my session by default, and it is linked to my right square bracket. So anytime, let's say I'm later on in the song and I'm listening, I'm working over here, I'm like, cool. I now wanna to listen to this from the very beginning. I simply hit my right square bracket and it takes me straight there. It also works if you're stopped. So let's say you're playing here, you stop, you work, you work, you work. You wanna listen from the beginning. Well, it takes you straight back there and you can play. Okay, so let's now move on to Max for Lie devices and some of their subsequent mappings. So the first one that I have up here is this notepad where I have put all of my macros so that when I forget them, because it does happen, I can come back here and look. I have at this point in time now pretty much fully memorized them, so I don't necessarily need it anymore, but yeah, it's there. Then there's this plugin called For You Project Time, which tracks the amount of time that I spend in each session. This is not a MaxFly device. It is a free plugin, part of Hoffa's free bundle. Truth be told, I don't actually use anything else from their bundle, just this. Um, but yeah, the paid version allows you to add in how much you're charging per hour, as well as how much time is left in the session, etc., etc. But I don't need any of those features. I just want something to track my time. And so the free version is great for me. Next up, we have Clip Gain 2. This thing is pretty widely known, but for anyone that hasn't seen it, it is amazing. It allows you to create a floating window variant of an audio clip's gain control view. So you link the floating window button to any key you want. For me, lowercase f made the most sense. And then anytime you have an audio clip selected, you can press F and all these controls will pop up where you can change its pitch, you can change its warp, warp mode, and of course, its gain. Next up, we have Loader, which is possibly my favorite Max for Live device of all time. And it allows you to load in plugins or any Ableton device or even samples using key maps. So what you do is you bring in the loader plugin and then you load each plugin or Ableton device or whatever it is you're using in here. But unfortunately, you cannot simply drag, let's say Pro-Q into here. It does not work. You see, it tries to load it as an actual device. So what you have to do is save the plugin as a preset using this little save icon. And then you see, you'll get this thing, Pro-Q VST preset, and that allows you to drag it in here. Okay, and the same goes for Ableton devices. If you grab Utility and you try to drag it in here, it's not gonna happen. But if you save Utility as a device using the little save icon, I called it Standard Utility over here. 
can drag it in and place it there. So that will now allow you to link macros to any of these. So when I hit Shift U on my keyboard, for instance, utility loads in or Shift E, EQ8. And then all my plugins, I've got linked to my number pad. So zero will load in Pro MB, and then one, two, and three will load in various EQs. Uh, four, five, six will be compressors. Seven, eight, nine will be saturators. And then at the top of my keyboard, I've got the forward slash and the star will load in Spectre and Ableton's multiband dynamics. So look at this. I loaded in all these plugins just now without even opening the browser. Isn't that amazing? So the next Max Belay device over here called Insert Where kind of pairs up with Loader a little bit, wherein it allows you to choose where a plugin is going to be loaded in. Now, you'll see that Loader actually has one of these built in, but it doesn't make a sound. This one makes a little boop to let you know where it's going to be placed. And so this is very handy if you're over here on the drum bus and you want to load in, let's say you've got a utility and you want to load in EQ8 to the left of it. Well, if I now hit four, my key for insert where, now I can hear it on the right, now I can hear it on the, uh, in the middle, so it'll go to the end of the chain. And if I hit it one more time, it goes to my left, meaning now when I load in EQ8, it will go to the left of the currently selected device. But if I were to hit it again twice more and it's now down the center, and I load in Pro MB, it will load to the end of the chain. So yeah, Insert Where allows you to choose where plugins are going to load in, and you get this little sound, which is amazing. So all right, everybody, that covers all my workflow hacks regarding custom key mapping and Max for Live devices. If you know of any others that are super helpful, please, please, please drop them in the comments. I'm always looking to expand my workflow library, if you will. But if you learned something or you didn't know any of these, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll chat to you soon.